Um, I think the big challenges for us are, first of all, heart disease. Heart disease has been around for over 100 years. Now, just note that for 100 years, the heart disease which concerns us and which was the, the major killer and still is one of the major killers, that was virtually unknown in the 1900s, the early 1900s. People got heart disease in terms of uh, hardening of the arteries and they got angina, but a heart attack was almost unknown in 1900. It rose rapidly and in the 1950s it reached a peak and was very, very worrying and was affecting uh, young men in particular. Now it is declining at the same rate that it, is, it, it increased in the early years of the uh, 20th century. We do not know why it rose, we do not know why it's declining. Now many people claim that they know and some will say, well, the nutritionists will say people are listening to me now, they've changed their diet and therefore there's this fall in heart disease. Nonsense. The figures don't justify that. The decline started long before dietary advice began to be given, long before exercise became uh, popular. The decline started and we really do not know. And if we put in all the advances in treatment as well as prevention, we might be able to explain at most a third and probably only a quarter of the decline in heart disease. Now it's still a major killer although it's declining and we do not know the cause. Now that seems to me extraordinary. That has been around for over a hundred years. We've had countless research studies and we still do not know the cause. We know some of the mechanisms, platelet stickiness, platelet aggregation, I've already mentioned, but we do not know the basic cause. The other thing which is a <clears throat> increasing challenge is dementia. We're an aging population, people are living longer. Now you might say, well, isn't that great? Isn't that an advance in medical treatment and medical prevention? Well, no, it's probably an advance in living standards, in uh, uh, <coughs> better new diets and uh, better working conditions, better housing conditions. Uh, there's less infectious diseases. That is one of the major causes for us living longer. But <clears throat> there are increasing numbers of people with cognitive decline and dementia. And again, we do not know the reason. Now, we divide dementia into two broad kinds. One is vascular, which uh, the prime example is a stroke. And <clears throat> we know the mechanism in the stroke. But again, we don't know the basic cause of a stroke. Why is it? that a clot develops in one of the cerebral arteries? Why is it that an embolus develops and travels to the brain? We don't know the basic causes of uh, vascular dementia. But then there is the uh, Alzheimer type of dementia, and that uh, <coughs> is a substantial proportion of dementia. And people like uh, Professor Julie Williams is investigating genetics the genetics of Alzheimer's disease and is making tremendous advances there. But I would still say we don't know the causal factors. We know some factors that seem to influence the degree of uh, <coughs> development of these uh, lesions leading to uh, Alzheimer's dementia. But that's the big challenge. And what we need is new hypotheses to investigate. We don't have the ideas to work on. There's no point throwing money at a, at a problem unless you have good hypotheses, good ideas to work on, and those are very scarce. Well, I grew up in a family of four boys. Uh, I was number four, so I had older brothers, and they were all doing medicine. And from my earliest days, I wanted to follow them. Uh, I never remember wanting to do anything other than medicine. I discovered many years later that it was one of my father's wishes. My uh, son, when he was about 10, said he wanted to keep tropical fish. And I said, well, okay. Uh, 
but only if you have two tanks because I want you to randomize the fish into two tanks. One tank will have hard water and one tank will have soft water. You're too young to remember, but about 30 years ago, there's tremendous excitement over hard water. People living in areas with a hard water supply had very much less heart disease than people living in areas with soft water. And it was thought hard water must contain something that is beneficial or soft water must contain something that's harmful. So I said, I, I knew that uh, fish don't get heart attacks, but I thought maybe there'll be a difference in mortality and this will uh, tell us something. So I mentioned this to Archie Cochran and Archie Cochran was so taken with this. He said, look, I'll pay for the tanks, I'll pay for the fish, I'll pay for the pumps, I'll pay for everything. So he did. And we set up our two tanks and every now and again, Archie would ask, well, how are the fish? And I, would, I said to him after a month or two, I said, it's strange. We put breeding fish exactly the same and they were randomized, literally fish and toss a coin in that one and this one. The population density is going up and up in the soft water, but there's no increase in population in the hard water. And Archie Cochran jumped up and down and said, that's even more interesting. Hard water may be contraceptive. <laughs> well, I, I sometimes tell the rest of the story by prefacing it with the statement somebody made that uh, you can have a lovely hypothesis and it can be slain by an ugly fact. My 10 year old son pointed out to me that there was a cannibal fish in the hard water tank. And every time a fish uh, developed, it was eaten. <laughs> <So>. <laughs>
uh, changes in the uh, ragged days at the corner of the mouth. Uh, you don't want one, uh, one person to see a patient for two minutes and uh, make a di snap diagnosis and say goodbye. No, you want to do this very carefully. And if you have photographs of a few hundred people, then you can uh, mix these up, some with the condition, some without the condition. You can give them to a number of observers and get them to grade them. And you can see how reproducible the uh, diagnosis is, how reproducible the grading of the uh, condition is. So photographs uh, are tremendously valuable in enabling that detailed research rather than just a snap diagnosis by uh, perhaps an experienced clinician. But uh, you can't repeat that and see if it is reproducible. I don't remember a study where we did that, but that certainly is possible and uh, is, is really only possible with, uh, if you have photographs. You can then randomize them and say, well, is this better or worse? Uh, otherwise, you're just remember, a clinician is trying to remember uh, somebody months ago, years ago. What was it like then? Is it worse now? And uh, if you have a large study with several thousand people, see one of the early studies done by Archie Cochran in the Rondo was of glaucoma, that is uh, increased pressure in the eye leading to patchy blindness. And that required a lot of photography uh, to pin down where, no it didn't, no it wasn't photography, to pin down the areas of blindness. Yes, the psychologists call this risk compensation. Uh, I eat brown bread so I can do this and that and the other. And uh, I am very worried about aspirin. I've talked a bit about aspirin uh, having a major effect, a major reduction in heart disease and stroke and a major reduction in cancer. I fear that an awful lot of people are going to say, well, I'm going to continue smoking. I'm taking an aspirin a day and I'm not going to bother taking exercise. And the health promotion is going to find it very much more difficult. It's such an easy uh, and effective alternative to changing. Um, to go back to your photographs, one of the difficulties is you say that now, of course, you take high definition photographs and so on. One of the difficulties we have in long term studies is we want to compare, let's say, uh, serum rhubarb taken 30 years ago or 20 years ago with serum rhubarb now, the labs will all have changed their technology and we can't necessarily compare them. And we keep urging laboratories, certainly during a study, now our Kerfilly study takes four years to see all the men, and we submit blood samples to many laboratories uh, for different tests. And we say to them, look, please don't change your method halfway through but still, they all change. Oh no, we've updated our method. We're getting better results now. But when we look at them, the first thousand men were there and the next thousand are there because the method's been changed. Now, if it's as neat as that, then we can allow for that statistically. But very often it isn't like that. But some of them are done by the new method and they're never very sure which ones we did <laughs> by the new method. <laughs> No, no, we, we only funded uh, the photography in the early, I don't know, five years, that would be my guess. Uh, and Ralph Marshall built up a department fairly rapidly and it became the biggest department in the country, didn't it? Still probably is. And uh, MRC had a, made a contribution and then didn't continue that. But he, he remained a friend and a great colleague. Well, I grew up in a family of five boys, uh, and I was number four, so I had several older brothers who were doing medicine, and I remember from my earliest days, I was fascinated by their chat, and I wanted to be a doctor, and I never had any other ambition but to do medicine. 
Well, I enjoyed, I have enjoyed every part of my medical career. I stayed on in hospital after my compulsory house years. I stayed on for nearly four years, moving from specialty to specialty because I enjoyed it all so much. But I felt I can't do this for 40 years. I asked too many questions. What's the evidence for this? Why do we treat a patient in this way? And then I'd move to another ward and find the treatment of that disease was a different uh, strategy. I find this disturbing. So then I thought I was going to general practice. I enjoyed that, but again, there wasn't enough uh, challenge in uh, general practice. And I got uh, an offer to be the junior member of a team looking at chest disease in an industry, in the flax industry. Well, I joined the team and I enjoyed that so much. The opportunity to ask questions, to search for answers, I just find that fascinating. And I determined that if I could, I would stay in research. And that was nearly 50 years ago and I've been in research ever since and I have enjoyed it immensely. Well, I was, I'm from the north of Ireland. You'd never guess that from my accent, would you? But uh, <clears throat> John Pemberton, the head of social medicine there, he interested me in uh, 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 epidemiology and in medical statistics. And uh, one of the towering figures at that time was Archie Cochran. And I simply wrote to Archie Cochran and asked, had he a vacancy in his unit? He invited me to come over here to Cardiff and he interviewed me over the period of three days. And uh, we clicked together. We had the same sort of uh, thinking and objectives in research. And so I joined him <clears throat> and I worked with him uh, until his retirement. And then I was honored to take over the epidemiology unit. And then when I retired from that some years ago, I was given an honorary chair in the Cardiff University and I'm very, very privileged to be able to continue working long after retirement. Archie Cochran was marvellous to work with. Uh, his strategy was to give us our head and let us uh, pursue uh, questions, hypotheses in which we were interested. But just every uh, few weeks he would just walk around his unit and he would uh, chat to each of us. He'd ask us what we were doing. And he had a marvellous ability to put his finger on some weakness in the study or some further opportunity. And I find that style of leadership uh, marvellous, but it was not my style. I hadn't the brilliance, I hadn't the ability to uh, manage a research team in that way. So when I took over Archie's unit, when I succeeded him, I set up weekly meetings and we had formal meetings of all the staff in the unit, right down to the junior staff. And I cultivated the attitude that uh, everything that went on, uh, everyone in the unit had a responsibility for it at some level. And so there was opportunity for people to ask questions, to comment, to make objections to what we were doing. And it welded the unit into uh, much more of a team than had been under Archie Cochran. Archie Cochran, of course, is uh, remembered uh, with great respect for the way that he promoted the randomized control trial, which has now become the gold standard in research. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> I have been asked to talk about uh, Archie Cochran on quite a number of occasions. And one of the titles that I've given my talk is Man of Genius with Feet of Clay. Because although Archie Cochran did more than anybody to promote the randomized control trial throughout medicine, uh, he never himself conducted a randomized control trial. So <coughs> uh, I remember him for his encouragement and the, the joy of uh, completing a randomized control trial and discussing the, the results with Archie and inevitably uh, discussing opportunities for further research. Every study that uh, one does in research raises more questions and provides more opportunities for further research. And that's one of the thrills of research. Uh, Tennyson put it that uh, 
uh, <coughs> knowledge is a door through which shines that I've broken down in Tennyson. But the idea that uh, finding a little bit of knowledge leads to further questions and a further search for knowledge. And that is one of the basic thrills in research. Yes, Archie <coughs> uh, wrote a paper for the BMJ, an account of his prisoner of war experiences, a very moving, uh, quite short article in, uh, published in the BMJ. And in that he describes uh, a study that he did with prisoners of wars, prisoner of war. Um, Archie was a medical officer of a prisoner of war camp in Salonika, and he describes the horrific conditions the massive famine oedema of many of the prisoners. And he conducted a trial in which he provided extra protein to some of the men. He didn't have enough to give it to all of them. So he provided to the men in some of the huts in the camp. And his index of success from providing this protein was the number of buckets of urine carried out from the different huts. Um, <clears throat> now, he wrote that up for the uh, publication in the BMJ, but his original title was My First, Worst and Only Successful Randomised Trial. And I said, Archie, you can't say that was randomised. It wasn't a true randomised control trial. So he took the word randomised out. And in fact, you're right, he never conducted a full randomised trial himself, but he encouraged us and everyone across the world he uh, encouraged people to set up randomised controlled okay. trials. Yes, after his death, uh, his papers and numerous letters and so on were put together and are held in Landau Hospital, the Cochran Archive. Um, but uh, reading through letters and uh, papers and so on never conveys the full impact of the man. Uh, he had a delightful manner, always questioning, always challenging. And in fact, uh, when he and I went to clinical meetings in those days, they were held in uh, CRI at the back of Cardiff Royal Infirmary. And uh, he would stand up at the end of a presentation by a clinician, perhaps a presentation of six cases of some condition, and Archie would stand up and uh, challenge the clinician and say, why didn't you randomise? And I would duck. I would think, what, uh, how am I going to be attacked at the end of this meeting? Because of course in those days most of the clinicians didn't know what randomised meant. And Archie assumed so much knowledge on the part of everybody that he didn't bother spelling it out. Why did you randomise treatment to half, selected at random? and so on, he just called it, uh, he just used the term, why didn't you randomise? But he was always challenging us to uh, set up more ambitious studies, to set up more studies, to look at more aspects of disease. And uh, one of the other models that he uh, encouraged was the prospective study, the large scale study where healthy people are examined and data is collected and then those people are followed forward in time and the uh, relationship of those baseline measurements to new disease is examined to see what factors are involved in the development of disease. And with his encouragement, my team set up the Kerfilly cohort study, the Kerfilly prospective study. And that is uh, just one of the major studies in the MRC unit but that study has led to almost 400 publications in the peer-reviewed uh, medical press. Well, I joined Archie Cochran in 1963, a long time ago, and I joined him shortly after he had set up his, his own unit. Uh, he had worked in the pneumoconiosis unit in Landau Hospital for quite a few years. He had developed methods of field research, visiting people and looking at diseases other than uh, pneumoconiosis. And so I joined him when his unit was very small 
and was just beginning to uh, develop field methods of research. <coughs> The uh, Welsh National School of Medicine in those days was also very small and embryonic and was housed at the back of Cardiff Royal Infirmary. I always looked on Cardiff Royal Infirmary as rather a rabbit warren because you had to go through wards to get to other wards and you had to walk down a long corridor to get to the Department of Pathology which was one of the main uh, departments in the uh, Welsh National School of Medicine. Uh, <coughs> there was a medical school house on Newport Road. It's long been demolished and replaced with a skyscraper. But that was uh, a centre where most of the senior people in the School of Medicine met for lunch. And I often joined them and dis joined in discussions. I always dreaded it when I went for lunch with Archie because he, over dinner even, would challenge the uh, clinicians why don't you randomize again, came up uh, repeatedly over lunch. But I made some very good friends. Archie tended to antagonize uh, clinicians. Uh, he was a bit aggressive and uh, challenged them. I tried to work alongside clinicians and I ran many studies uh, where clinicians played a ma major part. And that fostered good relationships uh, for many years. Well, Archie Cochrane, of course, uh, started uh, work in Wales on pneumoconiosis. And <clears throat> rather than examine patients with uh, lung disease, he went out into the community. He started surveying whole populations, and in particular the Rondavach. He always said he chose the Rondavach because it wasn't the smallest of the valleys, but he couldn't cope with larger valleys, and so that was the compromise. He developed uh, field research there, uh, seeing total populations, making comparisons between working miners and uh, disabled retired miners and the normal population, the non-mining population. <clears throat> I arrived and I decided that I would develop other branches of research and so I started work on iron deficiency anemia, which was quite a problem in those days. And we set up uh, randomised trials of adding iron to the diet of uh, some of the women in the Rhondda. Uh, we set up one very ambitious study where one of the bakeries uh, in Porth agreed to add uh, an iron salt to some of their loaves. And we distributed those loaves to a random sample of 300 homes where there, we had discovered there was a woman with iron deficiency and we supplied them with their daily bread for two years to look at the absorption of iron baked into bread. Other studies, we did studies on heart disease, <clears throat> studies on the Patterson-Kelly syndrome, which was a highly prized syndrome in South Wales because Patterson had uh, worked in Cardiff Royal Infirmary and uh, we did some research on that and showed that it wasn't actually a syndrome. It was a, a bit of a <coughs> a misleading term. But anyway, though, those were marvellous days because uh, there was a lot to be discovered. Epidemiology was in its infancy and Archie did more than anybody to develop field methods in epidemiology rather than basing work on uh, selected patients going out into the community and either finding every patient with every stage of a disease from very early or pre-symptomatic disease uh, or looking at total populations, and that's what we developed uh, when I took over the unit, looking at a total population, measuring a whole range of factors, and then watching for the development of disease. The other study which uh, brought us uh, a moment of fame was uh, aspirin. <clears throat> I was interested in heart disease, and around the late 60s, late 1960s, uh, pathologists were showing that uh, heart attacks were almost inevitably due to a clot in the uh, coronary artery and at the head of every clot there was a platelet plug, a plug of platelets. So pharmacologists then started working on uh, platelets, seeing what would reduce the stickiness of platelets and the less uh, chance of them forming a plug and blocking a coronary vessel. And uh, some of the early research by pharmacologists 
uh, showed that aspirin at a very low dose had a marvellous effect on platelet aggregation, platelet stickiness. So we set up the very first aspirin trial in the world and we uh, selected uh, <coughs> 1400 men who had had a recent heart attack and we randomised. Half of them received aspirin a day, one aspirin a day, and the other half received a dummy matching tablet. Well, at the end of two years, there was a 24% reduction in heart attacks. <clears throat> now, that was marvellous. That, that would be marvellous any time. But in those days, in the early 70s, there was really no treatment. There was no preventive measure to reduce the risk of a further heart attack in men who'd had uh, an attack. Uh, beta blockers had come out, but the first beta blocker had to be withdrawn because of side effects. So aspirin really hit the headlines and within 10 years six other trials had been set up and conducted in the States and in Germany. And uh, it's been a success story ever since. Of course now it's uh, an even bigger success story because at uh, October and November of last year uh, very uh, major evidence from long-term randomised control trials has shown that aspirin also reduces cancer, a range of cancers, and so aspirin really is presenting a number of challenges to uh, <coughs> medical practice, both in clinical practice, in uh, <coughs> screening for disease, uh, and in, in research. It's simply uh, incredible that uh, such a simple molecule and such an inexpensive, readily available drug has this major effect on the two major sources of disease and disability in, uh, in our community. Well, I have had 40 years of fascination with aspirin because, as, as I've already said, it's a very simple molecule, it's uh, inexpensive, uh, it's readily available. One of the areas that we explored was what we call immediate aspirin. When a person gets sudden chest pain, uh, what do they do? Well, they're advised to call an ambulance. What does the ambulance, what do the paramedics in the ambulance do? They ask the person, have you had an aspirin? And if uh, the person has severe chest pain, they give them an aspirin immediately. Now we thought that's very uh, reasonable, but why don't older people carry their own aspirin? Why don't they take it as soon as they get chest pain? So we did a bit of research on this and we published three papers on what we call immediate aspirin. And we showed that there's very, very good uh, reason to uh, take aspirin as early as possible if there is chest pain. Now, chest pain doesn't necessarily mean a heart attack, but if it's muscular, well, one aspirin won't do very much, but it'll certainly be appropriate to take aspirin for muscular chest pain. There are one or two other very unlikely conditions that could mimic a heart attack. And uh, so there are <coughs> disadvantages, but overwhelmingly, the advantage lies with taking early aspirin. Now we uh, published these papers and I was fascinated because a retired pharmacist in Manchester uh, saw one of these papers and he has developed what he calls an aspod and it's simply a little plastic container which holds two aspirins. It's on a little tag and on a key ring and he advises people to carry this with them at all time on their key ring or on their golf clubs or on their car, in their car or whatever. And then if they get sudden, severe chest pain, chest pain to take an aspirin immediately. But the uh, little tag on it says, chest pain, one, dial 999, then take one of these aspirins. We would not want to delay the admission of uh, patients to hospital with heart attacks. We're not looking to substitute that or delay it, but to dial 99 and then take an aspirin seems very reasonable. Well, that's a, a small additional thing. And we already know of some people uh, who have taken availability of this <coughs> and uh, who were found to have very, very minimal uh, <coughs> lesions at hospital when they arrived, uh, probably because of the very early aspirin. But very, very much more important than that is the preventive uh, 
par of aspirin for heart attacks and for um, cancer. Now, I'm involved in public health. I do not treat individual patients. I'm involved in looking at disease in the community as a whole. And I'm uh, an enthusiast for preventive medicine rather than treatment. Treatment, yes, great. It should go on and should be enhanced. But prevention is the ultimate goal. Now, I feel that aspirin, we're in a dilemma about this. Is this going to be regarded as a drug that should be kept under the control of doctors? Or is it something that the public should be told about, should be informed about, and should be given opportunity to make an informed decision on their own whether or not to take aspirin? Now, we looked at this in a number of ways. One was we looked at our large cohort of uh, men in Kerfilly, two and a half thousand men in Kerfilly. And we know everything about those men from early middle age to uh, we've been following them for over 30 years. And we looked at their vascular score. That is looking at the cholesterol level, the blood pressure, the body weight and other things and judging how likely uh, their risk is of a heart attack. And we found that the level at which aspirin would be beneficial was reached by those men by the age of about 48. So we published a paper and it uh, was very carefully t entitled uh, Aspirin for all over 50? Question mark. We wanted to provoke a discussion on that. And we were attacked. Uh, a colleague in uh, <coughs> Oxford said that uh, this was not a wise uh, bit of advice. Uh, because the number of bleeds that are caused by aspirin, unfortunately aspirin increases the risk of a bleed from the stomach. And he argued that the risk of a bleed uh, would, be bal would balance the benefit in a reduction of heart attacks. <clears throat> so we argued with him about it and we said, well, a bleed is, uh, a fairly, is minor compared to a heart attack. And now we would say it's a bleed is minor compared with a heart attack or cancer. And uh, it's hardly fair to just say the number of bleeds is roughly the same as the number of heart attacks that would be prevented. The severity of those two outcomes is so very, very different. But the argument goes on. Now, I feel with the uh, discovery, with the outcome of randomized control trials on aspirin and cancer, the balance has been tipped very definitely in favor of aspirin. And the uh, people involved in the work in people in Oxford involved in the work on aspirin and cancer recommend that people from the age of 45 on should consider whether or not they should take an aspirin a day. Well, that uh, resonates very nicely with the evidence that we had already published on by the age of 50 people should begin to consider, should I be on an aspirin a day? And it depends how they evaluate the outcome, how they evaluate it, not their doctor, not NICE, not some committee. How do I evaluate a stroke, a heart attack, or a, on the other hand, a stomach bleed? Well, I know that the thing that I dread above everything else is a stroke. Any impairment of what uh, brain power I still have, I dread that, so I will take an aspirin a day. And if I do get a stomach bleed and I'm rushed into hospital for a blood transfusion, well, that's unfortunate, but that doesn't leave any sequelae. And that actually doesn't have uh, any apparent increase in mortality. Stomach bleeds do carry a risk of death. About 4% of stomach bleeds lead to, <coughs> lead to death. But we have examined the evidence very carefully and there is no evidence that people on aspirin have a higher death rate from stomach bleeds than those not on aspirin. They do have twice the risk of a stomach bleed, but no increase in death from a stomach bleed. So I'm prepared to take that risk in order to reduce my risk of a stroke, a heart attack or cancer. Very little has been done on that, and I lament this, that because aspirin is such an inexpensive drug, the pharmaceutical companies are not interested in funding work on aspirin, and very little has been done 
to try and investigate ways of reducing the risk of a bleed. Now, it is known that if a, a person has uh, an infection in the stomach, Helicobacter pylori, then there is an increased risk of a bleed. Uh, and there is a little scrappy evidence that the treatment of Helicobacter pylori, this infection in the stomach, reduces the risk of a bleed. Um, <clears throat> there is a, another drug, a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, and that, if given together with the uh, aspirin, will reduce the risk of bleeding. Now that's uh, unfortunate. One doesn't like giving more drugs to prevent some side effect. What I have recommended, and I have to confess that I have no hard evidence for this, but I've recommended that a glass of milk is taken with aspirin. Now that will certainly reduce the irritation of the aspirin, just the gastric discomfort of taking a tablet of aspirin. But there is a little evidence that if uh, calcium is given together with aspirin, then the effect of the aspirin in reducing cancer is enhanced, very considerably enhanced. So uh, milk only has, a uh, glass of milk only has about 300 milligrams of calcium, not a very large amount, but it may be that it will enhance the effect of aspirin on in its reducing the risk of cancer. It will reduce the irritation and it may reduce the risk of um, a stomach bleed. But I think it is unfortunate. I think the, uh, there should be a call for more work on ways of reducing the bleeding from aspirin. There are two important downsides of aspirin, uh, prevention by aspirin. One is the stomach bleed, which I think is not a very important risk. The other is that the risk of a hemorrhagic stroke. Strokes are of two kinds. The ischemic stroke due to a clot or due to a, a, an embolus. That uh, accounts for between 80% and 90% of strokes. There's a very small number of strokes that are due to a bleed and those tend to be more serious strokes. Now aspirin unfortunately increases the risk of the hemorrhagic stroke. We don't know any way of reducing that. It's a very rare complication, the most unfortunate complication of aspirin. But it's more than balan balanced by the beneficial effects on heart attacks, on stroke and on cancer. <clears throat>
you would expect the very latest treatment, the very best treatment, wouldn't you? Oh, yes, a man would say. That's my right. I would say, now, how do you think that was developed? How do you think that was tested? It was tested in work such as we are doing. Many, many a man would say to me, OK, Doc, put me down. I'll come to your special clinic. I'll, part I'll be involved in your research. That's not permiss permissible now. We're not allowed to do that. And the public, I think, is very suspicious of research, research. And there's a distrust of doctors. And I find this very disappointing. Many studies are being published in which there's been perhaps a 60% refusal rate. Now, how do 40% of people, how do they represent the whole community? The answers that are obtained from a sample of people like that are flawed. The uh, <coughs> people who volunteer for a study now do not represent the whole community and the results that are obtained and the conclusions that are drawn are flawed and may be seriously misleading. So I find it very disappointing, the attitude uh, of the public and the way it is enhanced by ethics committees, that we're not allowed to go back to people who have refused. No, it's their right, they, if they refuse, then you must not approach them again. Well, yes, they have rights, but also as members of society, they have responsibilities. And I want to do the very best research. I want to produce the very best evidence. And I can't do that when there are people refusing. And I'd like to explain that to people who refuse, that they are harming research. They're harming the advance of knowledge. But no, I'm not allowed to do that. The other frustration is the way that studies are reported and um, <clears throat> I've had a great concern about this for many years <clears throat> but opportunity arose uh, just over a year ago. Uh, there had been some very bad headlines in the uh, papers about some research and I was speaking at a research meeting in London and I just said I, as I began my talk, I just said that uh, there have been these headlines and I said, but I think we are partly to blame for this. We do very little, in fact most of us do nothing, to try and help educate the uh, medical reporters and help them to understand research better and write uh, more truthful and more realistic uh, accounts of research. Well, about 10 days later, I got an invitation to go to Beijing and uh, hold a seminar for medical reporters. Well, I find that such a golden opportunity that I actually wrote a little booklet, about a 20-page booklet on understanding medical research. I gave a two and a half hour seminar to over 60 reporters in Beijing, and it was delightful, it went down so well. Well, it was evidently judged a success by the organisers because a few weeks later I got an invitation to go to Stockholm and I talked to over 50 reporters in Stockholm and evidently I hadn't exhausted uh, every possibility because a few weeks later I was asked to go to Riga in Lithuania <clears throat> and I gave a, a talk there to over 60 reporters on and the way I focus my talk is I pick out issues which cause confusion and difficulty. And I give a general talk on medical research, the methods of general methods of epidemiology and research and ways of drawing conclusion. But I stop every now and again where one of these difficulties is illustrated and I give a little cameo talk on that particular difficulty. Yes, they're, they're in, in epidemiology, but really in research generally, there are various basic strategies. And I see these as the simplest method of study is simply the survey, to question a, a group of people or a group of patients about certain factors that might be uh, of relevance to disease. And you get the prevalence, the occurrence, the frequency of certain symptoms, of certain factors like blood pressure or cholesterol level. And you can draw certain conclusions from that simple survey, cross-sectional survey at one point of time of factors relevant to disease. That's the very simplest kind of study. Then there's a case control study 
where cases of disease are compared with uh, matched people without the disease and differences in their past diet, in their past exercise level, in their past blood pressure, in their past cholesterol level or whatever are the comparisons are made. Now we call that, I'm afraid we call that the Friday afternoon study. It's uh, not always easy and sometimes it uh, is the only uh, way of doing research. For instance, we were involved in a huge case control study of 6,000 infants and children looking at uh, causal factors in childhood cancer. Now that was a very exacting study that took about five years and uh, involved uh, 6,000 uh, subjects. <clears throat> so, but it, it, it's a hypothesis generating study where you can do a quick Friday afternoon study to see, well, what factors in diet look as if they're related to this disease? And then you set up a prospective study, which is a very uh, profitable and very productive form of research. It has to be large. Most prospective studies are based on 5,000, 10,000 people. Uh, <coughs> you record every possible uh, <coughs> factor that may be involved in a disease. And then you follow those people forward in time over the next five, 10, 20 years. Our Carfilli study has been running for 30 years. And you look at how those baseline factors relate to the development of disease later in life. Now we set up the Carfilli study and we studied heart disease initially. Then as the men got older, we studied factors which were predictive of stroke. And now, sadly, the men are quite elderly and sadly we're looking at factors involved in dementia, cognitive decline and dementia. But that is one of the additional benefits in the prospective study. The randomized controlled trial, which as I've already said is the gold standard of research, examines one hypothesis, the relationship of aspirin to heart disease, heart attacks. But the prospective study can collect information on a whole range of factors. Uh, lifestyle factors, dietary factors, exercise, and then biochemistry, haematology, immunology. And we have all that on the, the men in Kerfili. And then you can study the development of heart attacks, of stroke, of Parkinson's disease, of hearing loss, of uh, <coughs> a whole range of factors, prostate cancer. And it will all come out of that one study. So it's an enormously productive but very expensive. And the disadvantage for research workers is the real gold comes from that study 10 years, 15 years after it's been set up. Now that's difficult for somebody setting up a career and developing a portfolio of research in their career to set up a study which isn't going to yield anything of much value for 10 or 15 years. That's difficult to motivate oneself and difficult to get funding. But we were lucky, we set up our major cohort study <clears throat> in the days when funding was much easier and people, as I've already indicated, were very much more willing to be involved in these studies. We have a trivial refusal rate in our Kerfilly study. We've made friends with these men. They know that there's value coming out of it. When I talk to medical students, or in fact when I give a talk to any group, I very often say that there are three main sources in medical research. There are clinical studies, that is the study of patients who by definition have the disease and most patients studied in clinical research have advanced disease or complicated disease, very valuable, and the outcome is to get to, to develop better methods of treatment. Then there's laboratory research, and that is where mechanisms of disease are studied and a better understanding of the disease process is sought. And of course, other aspects of laboratory work is improving prognosis, uh, predicting how a disease is going to go and improving diagnosis of a disease. But the third method of research, there's clinical research, laboratory research, and then there's epidemiology, the truth. Now, I, I hold that there's an element of truth in that. I say that to, 
just to irritate my colleagues, but they know I'm, I'm just uh, goading them. But there's an element of truth in that, in that the epidemiologist seeks to look at the whole spectrum of disease from pre-symptomatic, that is early disease that hasn't yet been discovered. Patient hasn't presented to a doctor, hasn't had any tests, but we see people in that state, we do the test and we say, you've got very early disease. And we follow through to advanced disease and sadly to death. So we look at the whole spectrum of disease. And the other thing is that we're involved in prevention. Now, a politician in opposition once said that the trouble in this country is we have a national sickness service. We don't have a national health service. There's very little done to preserve health, to prevent disease. Well, I agree with that. But in actual fact, it's very understandable because there are very few good hypotheses about prevention of disease. It's very much easier with somebody who's got a disease to say, let's try this, let's try something else. Marvelous, and that should be done. But in preventing disease, when you don't know the cause of a disease, then how are you going to prevent? You're fumbling, you're, you're, you, you've got to study factors. You've got to identify factors that may be causal in the development of disease. Now that is the heart of epidemiology, starting with healthy people and then following them and measuring the various factors at intervals uh, as the, the, some of them get disease and as the disease develops. That's very long term. I've been in epidemiology for nearly 50 years and my successes I could probably list on one hand and only one or two of them are really important. It's very difficult, but it's fascinating. That's the arch where through gleams that untraveled world. <laughs>
the findings of medical research. The uh, provost uh, in, in Stephen Tomlinson was marvellous. He just, at the end of a 10 minute uh, chat, he just said, okay, get on with it. So I started with great apprehension and I asked uh, the provost to give the first lecture on diabetes and he gave a marvellous lecture. Well, it has grown in uh, uh, popularity since then. And uh, I uh, ran the uh, public lectures for eight years and I was delighted to uh, be able to hand the task on to James Matthews in immunology and biochemistry. And I'm tremendously delighted at how well those are going. Uh, another venture that we had was to set up a citizen's jury. I have had an interest in uh, pr the preservation of health because I'm an epidemiologist. That's my main focus, the preservation of health. Now I see an enormous difference between the preservation of health and the treatment of disease. The treatment of disease has been delegated to healthcare professionals and surgeons and physicians and nurses and practitioners of all kinds are highly trained to treat disease. The prevention of disease is the subject's own responsibility. It's my choice what diet I take, how much exercise I take. My sexual practice is my own decision. And so I feel that the two are very separate and the responsibility that we as doctors and healthcare practitioners have in relation to the preservation of health is simply to give balanced information to the man in the street, to the general public, so that he and she can take an informed decision about preserving their own health. Now, I think that is very obvious with regard to things like um, <clears throat> diet and exercise and so on. But now that drugs are beginning, beginning to be developed, which will preserve health, drugs like low-dose aspirin, drugs like statins, whose decision is it whether a person should take these drugs? They've all got side effects, they've all got undesirable effects. Who is to make the judgment about whether the benefit outweighs the disadvantages? I think it's arrogance that the doctor should say, I will make that decision for my patients. But they're not your patients. These are initially healthy people. They're not your patients. And I think we have a tremendous obligation to give information, balanced information to people about the health, the health risks and the benefits uh, <coughs> of preventive measures. So we set up what's called a citizen's jury. This is modelled on the legal procedure. And we got 16 people chosen to represent the general public with no vested interest in uh, medicine, no vested interest in drugs or anything like that. And we brought them to the City Hall in Cardiff, as it happens. And for three days, we got a, a group of specialists uh, to lecture these people on uh, aspects of the prevention of health. Some were enthusiastic about uh, what I've just been saying. Others were not convinced about it. So we had the pros and the cons. And at the end of three days, that group of people wrote a report. And they sided with what I have just said totally and they said yes the preservation of health is our own responsibility but we should be given better information we should be given information more more uh, more balanced information uh, about the effect of various preventive measures and one very interesting thing that they said and this was not prompted but they said with regard to drugs and medical interventions that are uh, aimed at preserving health, we think we should be given information even before doctors are agreed and are unanimous about whether these should be uh, taken up. It's our responsibility whether or not we take it up and it's for us to decide whether or not the benefits outweigh the risks. The other thing I've already mentioned in uh, communication is trying to help medical reporters to report uh, the results of research more accurately and more in a more balanced way.
I love the opportunities that do arise to give encouragement to junior colleagues. Uh, I was encouraged by uh, Professor Pemberton in Belfast and by Archie Cochran and by numerous others, but those two in particular. Uh, I seek opportunities to give encouragement. And I find certain things that I've got to do uh, not easy. And for example, refereeing papers for publication. I find it very difficult to be critical of um, papers written by junior colleagues uh, and submitted for publication. It's a duty that I think we all have to do. It's an enormous task. Uh, and I think we've all got to play a part in it. And I find that difficult because I don't want to discourage people. I also find it difficult when examining uh, a thesis for a higher degree. Uh, it's lovely if it's a well-written thesis and the work is good and merits the degree. But where it's borderline or where it's not good enough, I feel it's, I've got to be responsible. I've got to say this is not good enough. This cannot uh, <coughs> pass the, uh, does not pass the standard required. But I find that difficult. So I think we all, senior people, have a duty to encourage. Uh, <coughs> and I also regard it as a privilege to be able to encourage people to take part in research. Well, when I came to uh, Cardiff, I've already mentioned that uh, research was relatively easy. Funding was not a problem. Uh, and uh, there, was a, there were a lot of spare resources. Laboratories would very happily cooperate with us and do tests with no charge. And we had a, a funded team to do epidemiological research. So it was relatively easy. Now that has changed enormously. I've already talked about how people are suspicious of research and are resentful uh, of doctors and question uh, doctors. Now, there wasn't that element, or it was very, very minor when I came to Cardiff. There wasn't the same competition. But one of the big differences that I see is the Medical Research Council had about 40 research units, and they were funded uh, by the Treasury to uh, set up units in areas where knowledge was deficient and to fund those units for the duration of the uh, <coughs> work in that unit. So that made a very favorable climate where we had ongoing funding. We could set up long-term studies and we didn't have to spend a lot of time begging for money and writing research protocols and funding applications. That has changed totally now. There is intense competition for money. There's a lot of rivalry and sadly a, a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, competition, unhealthy competition between research workers, a lot of secrecy. I wasn't aware of any secrecy in the early days of research. Uh, we collaborated openly with clinicians and discussed over lunch in the medical school house on Newport Road. We would discuss opportunities for research very, very openly because we were all in it together. Now it's become highly competitive. Okay, well, when I came to Cardiff, um, it really was, may I say, I judged it a second rate medical school. I had come from Belfast and uh, uh, Belfast was much more uh, wealthily uh, supported by the government of Northern Ireland. Uh, Cardiff was a second-rate medical school but it progressed very rapidly and uh, I was in on the uh, plans for UHW and the move of the, medical, the Welsh National School of Medicine as it was then. Uh, that moved up to the Heath site and really uh, took off from that point. But I'd like to go back further. The Welsh National School of Medicine was set up about 1904 and the very first chair in the Welsh, Welsh National School of Medicine was a chair of preventive medicine set up by Emily Talbot in memory of her father. And the Talbot chair of preventive medicine is the oldest chair in Cardiff. But a few years after that had been set up, 
uh, a builder, a building firm, gave money for the building of an institute of preventive medicine. And that still stands, a beautiful brick building on the corner of um, the parade uh, and uh, one of the side roads off the parade. It's a beautiful building. Uh, it is now the Department of Astronomy. Preventive medicine was downgraded in the early years of the Welsh National School of Medicine and uh, <coughs> one of the uh, surgeons set out to uh, limit the Department of Preventive Medicine and it was banished to the top floor of the uh, Institute of Preventive Medicine and the medical school, the Welsh National School of Medicine took over the rest of the building. Well, I was interested to go along to um, investigate the building now. The front door, beautiful oak doors, with a beautiful uh, surround, uh, is now locked. You can't get into the building other than going through the Department of Astronomy. And I thought, well, it's not altogether surprising that the Institute of Preventive Medicine is now part of the Department of Astronomy, because they're both astronomy and uh, preventive medicine. They both reach for the skies. They set such high uh, aims and ideals. Well, now more recently, I think there have been marvellous developments with the uh, merging of University College Cardiff and the uh, former College of Medicine. Uh, that gives much uh, more frequent uh, contact and collaboration between the different departments. And I myself have collaborated with quite a number of uh, uh, colleagues in the uh, uh, former uh, Cardiff College, University College Cardiff, uh, with whom I wouldn't have had any contact beforehand. It's also a very much more attractive base for uh, applying for funding. And I think the future is very bright for Cardiff. Uh, one of the uh, things which thrills me in particular is that there's a new building going up, the Cochrane Centre, and that will house the uh, major part of the medical college and the teaching will be housed there. That is, uh, from the drawings, is going to be a beautiful building, a large building, and that's what Cardiff needed. The medical school expanded but the facilities did not expand appropriately, but they will now that the Cochran building has gone up. And I look forward to the opening of that building. Just one downside, it's uh, being built just outside the window of my office and where I used to look over Cardiff and see the sun uh, uh, each, each day, now I just see a blank wall, the lift shaft of the, Contra of the Cardiff uh, Centre, of the Cochrane Centre. Yes, yes. Cochrane is undoubtedly the uh, most outstanding figure. He was a Scot, of course, uh, and he never <coughs> lost his uh, love of Scotland, and he would tell everybody uh, that he was not a Welshman, he was a Scotsman. But he was loyal, intensely loyal. He was director of the MRC unit, but he was also uh, <coughs> the, uh, held the chair, the Davis Davis chair, David Davis chair of uh, preventive medicine, tuberculosis and, and uh, chest diseases in the Welsh National School of Medicine. Well I've said a lot about um, prospective studies and uh, they are difficult to set up. They require long-term funding the rewards are well in the future and so setting up a prospective uh, study uh, is, is not easy. But the most remarkable prospect study of, prospective study of all is known as Biobank. This is costing over, the first phase of this is costing 60 million pounds. The uh, centre is in Oxford but uh, the Department of um, <clears throat> primary care and public health in Cardiff University has a major role and John Gallagher is a member of the steering committee for Biobank. The aim of Biobank is to uh, <coughs> identify uh, half a million subjects, healthy subjects throughout the UK, 
to take uh, uh, t uh, basic uh, medical details, uh, details of lifestyle, of diet and so on from these people and follow them forward into the future. A key element is genetics and so every subject is asked to give a sample of blood that is used for tests such as cholesterol and uh, other biochemical tests but DNA is extracted and that will be used in long-term studies of the genetic basis for disease and for health. That is a very exciting study. Now the, the, uh, in, in, in the enrolment of half a million people was conducted from Newad Mary Onoth in the College of Medicine here. And uh, John Gallagher and <coughs> my department uh, had a team of about 15 people who were on the telephone all day, every day, phoning people all over the country, booking them for special clinics at which they uh, gave their inf medical information and gave samples of blood and had height and weight measured and so on. Uh, those people will be recalled at intervals for further measurements and that is going to be an incredible resource for the testing of countless hypotheses. That's not focused on one hypothesis. The value of a prospective study like that is you've got basic information which is likely to be uh, relevant to a whole host of diseases and that is likely to be an incredible resource for the, this generation and the next generation. Um, I regard it a great privilege to talk from time to time to uh, groups in schools and to individuals and after all I've grandchildren two of whom I've managed to persuade to do medicine. Uh, I think within medicine uh, there's a variety of careers and if one is happy to uh, follow a protocol and follow uh, what is usually done with a disease or with a patient then there's lots of medicine where you do that but if one has an inquiring mind and if one has what I think I have a giant element of dissatisfaction in me I always want to better things I always want to find some better way of handling a situation then medical research is is wonderful because as I've already quoted uh, medical research is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margins fade forever and forever as I move and adding to knowledge uh, and finding better ways of doing things uh, never you never run out of uh, satisfaction in that you never run out of motivation for further research so I think medicine is a very, very broad career and I have advised countless uh, senior school kids, uh, look, it's a difficult decision, should you do medicine or should you do engineering or some other task? A more difficult decision is when you do get your medical degree, which branch of medicine am I going to go into? They are so different. If you like interacting with people, then general practice is marvellous and people will look for counselling as well as for a drug or for treatment of disease. But if you're technically interested, well, ophthalmology is delicate surgery, a keyhole surgery, very, very challenging and developing all the time. If you just have an inquiring mind and feel that you'd like to add to knowledge, well, there are areas, huge areas within medical research. So I think medicine offers the biggest range of careers once you get a medical degree.